Welcome to the 231st of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion on politics, history, and the pandemic with historian Kevin M. Cruz. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope, and you can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, March 2nd, 2021, there are 2,554,559 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 518,899 deaths reported in the United States. That's up from 514,216 yesterday, and there are 1,606 deaths reported in South Korea. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is, Mercia Bowser, sister of DC mayor, dies of coronavirus at age 64. This was written by Julie Zausmer, published February 25th, 2021 in the Washington Post. Just hours after DC Mayor Muriel E. Bowser confirmed 1,000 COVID-19 deaths in her city, she made another somber announcement, this one far more personal. Her sister had died of the virus. Mercia Bowser, who died last Wednesday morning at age 64, was the eldest of the six Bowser siblings raised in a family deeply involved in the district and its politics. The mayor, 48, is the youngest. Mercia was loved immensely and will be missed greatly as she joins the legion of angels who have gone home too soon due to the pandemic. Mayor Bowser wrote in a statement Wednesday afternoon, I ask that you continue to keep those who have been lost or impacted by the pandemic and those who are working so hard to protect us from it in your thoughts and prayers. She thanked the staff at Washington Hospital Center who treated Mercia for coronavirus related pneumonia and said that her sister was retired from a career serving children, the elderly and people with behavioral disorders through Catholic Charities and the DC Office on Aging. Garcia's work included advising Metro on services for people with disabilities and helping train DC police cadets on crisis intervention, as well as providing services for people with mental illnesses and mental and physical disabilities, according to professional websites. The mayor's statement listed many siblings, nieces, nephews, and friends who mourn her sister, along with their parents, Joseph and Joan Bowser, Mercia Bowser was a graduate of Fisk University, a historically black private university in Nashville. Although she and her siblings were raised Catholic, she was active at Israel Metropolitan Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in the Petworth neighborhood, Bowser's statement said. She was in high school when Muriel, the only other girl in the family, was born. When Bowser first ran for mayor in 2014, a profile of her in the Washington Post recounted how Marcia gently teased her for following in the politically active footsteps of her father. From the time she was a child, Marcia called Muriel J.B. Jr. As mayor, Bowser has been the public face of the district's coronavirus response, making choices about what to close and what to open in the city, including schools and restaurants. Twice a week at news briefings, she shares the latest numbers and reminds residents to wear masks and maintain social distance. Almost every time, within the first minutes of her remarks, she uses the word tragically before addressing the virus death toll. On Wednesday morning, Bowser declared a day of remembrance for lives lost to COVID-19 and encouraged houses of worship to honor the city's 1,000 dead at 6 p.m. The mayor, who's a generally private person and rarely mentions her daughter, parents, or siblings, called the thousandth death a reminder that this pandemic has forever changed families and communities. 
Even when the pandemic ends, she said, for many, the pain and loss will still be there. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today, one I've been greatly looking forward to. Let me introduce my guest, Kevin M. Cruz, is a professor of history at Princeton University, he specializes in the political, social, and urban and suburban history of 20th century America. He takes particular interest in conflicts over race, rights, and religion, and the making of modern conservatism. Kevin is currently conducting research for his new book, The Division, John Doerr, The Justice Department, and the Civil Rights Movement, which is under contract to Basic Books. He's also the author, the co-author with Julian Zelizer, who's been a guest of COVID Calls, of the book Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, and also the author of One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America, and White Flight, Atlanta and the Making of Modern Conservatism, as well as numerous other edited and co-authored volumes and articles, and he also maintains a lively social media presence on Twitter. Kevin Cruz, welcome to COVID Calls. Thanks for having me, Scott. I'd like to start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling in from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there today. I'm calling from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, and the pandemic uh, situation is fine, I guess. Uh, we're, we're in a place where they've taken things pretty seriously. Uh, the public schools are open with a lot of testing. Uh, the university, we still have remote teaching. Uh, people are pretty good about wearing masks around town. Uh, and thankfully, I live in a state that is not one of the ones uh, where a Republican governor has just announced everything's open uh, and we're going to pretend like it's all done. So uh, feeling all right about that. What's the vac vaccination situation there in, in New Jersey and Prince? Coming along well. I've actually got friends who are kind of in my category who have gotten uh, appointments over the last week. So uh, fingers crossed. Uh, hopefully, uh, my wife and I will be able to get it soon. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been, it, it, this is a case where I think it's good to be in the position of having to wait a little bit. Yeah, uh, right. If you're not in the in the urgent group, that's something I think to be happy about. Uh, but we're kind of in that stage where someone on Twitter just said, uh, you know, this is the new fear of missing out is when friends your age uh, are getting the vaccine. That's the ultimate kind of, I want that too. But uh, we're getting there. And you said you're teaching remotely, but the students are back or they're in the dorm rooms taking remote yeah, classes? Yeah, I'd say or? about, uh, at least in my classes, probably a half, maybe a two thirds of them are are back on campus or around town, which is uh, more than I thought. But I guess uh, there's, you know, a, a real desire after probably a summer and a fall semester of being at home with their parents uh, to get out for them and, and brave the world. Um, all the teaching is still done remotely, um, uh, most of it at least. Uh, but, but they're, um, uh, they're, they're tuning in from laptops in their dorm rooms or apartments. So on January 6th, there were a few people that I wanted to hear from. And as you might expect, my list included historians. Uh, and so I wanted to just start out by asking you a little bit about what your, your day was like that day. I know you, you're a historian, but you keep very attuned to current political events. How did you watch what was happening? What were you thinking? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about it. Well, so, so I knew that, you know, we knew the rally was going to happen. In fact, I had a, um, I started that day. I have a, a, a semi-regular column on MSNBC Daily, and I'd written about this rally that was going to take place on the Ellipse, uh, this, this uh, place in, uh, in D.C., not far from the White House, where protest rallies have traditionally happened. And I talked a little bit about these past ones. Uh, and that preview of, this protest that's going to be at the ellipse was quickly uh, eradicated when the protests moved from the ellipse to the Capitol. And so like everyone else, I was watching uh, what was going on because I, I had a sense things were, uh, it was going to be a big protest. I didn't quite get a sense of how things were going to get out of hand. And so like everyone else, I was watching, if you remember the news coverage of the time was all on what was going on inside the chambers. Right. And they were reading, you know, the uh, as the um, uh, uh, House and Senate uh, were engaged in, in reviewing the election results. And, and usually this boring matter of just kind of certifying them, uh, acknowledging that they've got the results from all the states that have already certified them. Uh, it's usually pretty boring, but we all thought this was something to watch because there was going to be some objections made. And as I'm watching that on TV, I'm also, uh, as is my want when I'm watching something political, I've got Twitter up on my laptop. 
and seeing what's going on. And I was increasingly seeing more and more stories on Twitter about what was going on outside, that things were starting to get out of hand. It was getting a little um, uh, beyond rowdy to, uh, to menacing and that there were suddenly these clashes with police. And I remember turning to my wife going, why are we, why am I not getting this story on, on TV? And, and it soon became kind of the box in the corner. And then it became the real story, obviously. And so I, I kind of watched that story escalate and, and, and take over uh, the national narrative. And then like everyone else, um, uh, watched in horror as this, this thing unfolded, uh, wondering why uh, there wasn't uh, more of a crackdown. You know, we've seen um, uh, the police response when it's say a Black Lives Matter march or something like that, uh, or, or you know, the Antifa in uh, Portland or wherever, happy to throw uh, the, the tear gas and, nice. and escalate things quickly and make a lot of arrests. Uh, and I was kind of puzzled at the reaction there. And we're still, I guess, learning what's going on. You know, that, that um, the way you describe your sort of uh, news diet that day, so you're kind of watching the mainstream news and then monitoring the Twitter. The, what do you think was the sort of flashover point there? When did the mainstream media get a clue, do you think? What was the tell to them that there was something going on here that was really out of the ordinary? I mean, obviously pulling the Senate off the floor of the Senate is one thing, but there was a lot yeah. happening before that took place. I, I think it was the first the first sense that, the, that a barrier had been breached. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. wasn't about alarming that the that that the kind of the MAGA mob had moved up towards the Capitol. The president had called on them to do that. They kind of all knew that. I think people thought it was going to get up there and, and peter out. And instead, the clashes with police and then kind of overrunning the police with those exterior barriers and getting up onto the steps, that's where I think the the... the the switch really got flipped, and they realized it was uh, it was the story, not uh, not a tangent. Are you surprised that there hasn't been a thorough investigation to this point? And what do you think about the the process that's ongoing and Congress to call for something like that? Well, I think it absolutely needs a, a commission, and I think that's the the way to go. Um, and certainly, in terms of the timing of these things in the past, uh, they take a little bit to get going. Uh, there certainly wasn't going to be one right away because Republicans still controlled the Senate. Uh, and then even the, the switch of that chamber took a little time once the Georgia results came in and McConnell and uh, uh, kind of dragged his feet. Uh, and then we had impeachment, which I think gummed up the works uh, as well a little bit. So it's not surprising I didn't get to it right away. What did surprise me was uh, the lack of a briefing from law enforcement. You know, mm -hmm. I would have expected press conferences, if not that night, the next morning, from the FBI, from the Capitol Police, from the Metropolitan Police Department, on and on. Um, it's kind of remarkable that uh, we just got FBI Director Ray in front of uh, uh, the Senate this week uh, and finally got some answers from, from basic questions. So a lot of misinformation has been allowed to spread uh, over the last, uh, you know, almost two months now, uh, which, is, which is kind of remarkable. While you were watching, I, I, I wonder where your mind went for historical parallels as a person who's an expert in the 1960s and 70s and civil rights movement, but also backlash to civil rights. Um, what were you seeing in the crowd there that was summoning parallels or or not? It, do you feel like this really the context here is is specific to our time? Well, I, I think like like everything in the Trump era, we, we've sort of seen elements of this before. And it's it's more the the, the particular combination of everything all at once and the volume. Uh, is what really makes it unique. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, seeing um, the sort of classic white backlash movements, you know, a, a, a Trump rally crowd looks an awful lot like a rally crowd for George Wallace in 1968. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Trump on stage looks a lot like Wallace on stage in 1968. It's really remarkable. I can't tell you uh, how many times I kept coming back to that basic point of comparison. Uh, him and Nixon uh, over the last four years, uh, I think I've written myself out on on Wallace comparisons, uh, but but it just it, it, it's such a perfect analog in terms of both uh, the tone he takes, alternately menacing and, and, and jokey, uh, the way in which the crowd is made to feel uh, like they're truly the victims, uh, and if they don't get involved and push back against these liberal establishment forces that are pressing them, uh, right. the country itself will be lost. I mean, on and on, uh, uh, down to the actual. A list of grievances. You know, uh, Wallace always talk about bureaucrats, Trump of the deep state. Uh, they always talk about anarchists and uh, and uh, to varying tones, uh, racial minorities are, are are identified here as threats. Um, so 
uh, all of that uh, seems really familiar. So to see that in the crowd on January 6th uh, was really nothing new. What was new was the the way in which that crowd was was mobilized um, uh, and and set to go against the, the Capitol. And that reminded me not of Wallace, really, but the kind of things we saw in Reconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. In which there is this constant trope uh, that the elections are illegitimate through the simple act of black voting, right? Right. Uh, right. And, and here we had it kind of whitewashed in a metonymy of place in which the complaints were about Detroit and Philadelphia and Atlanta, uh, places that are, are coded in the minds of at least uh, 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 Trump's own voters as black, right? Never mind that Philadelphia was actually the one place in Pennsylvania where Trump gained votes. Right. Uh, and it was actually right. the white collar, mm -hmm. uh, white suburbs around Philadelphia that really are what uh, amounted to him losing the state. He singled out Philadelphia the same way with Detroit and, and Atlanta and other areas like that. And that general idea that this election was illegitimate because of black voting. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to act to correct it and we'll be justified in whatever we do, uh, whether it be the kind of, uh, you know, uh, white supremacist violence of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1870s and 1880s, or whether it be uh, the MAGA mob attacking policemen and, and you know, shouting hang Pence and where's Nancy as they stormed mm -hmm. through the Capitol, uh, presumably to do violence against them. Um, all of that is justified because uh, these uh, uh, these white voters uh, are the true victims is the way in which it's presented. And so that was very familiar. We certainly haven't seen this this scale, you know, uh, the 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 Confederate uh, neo Confederate mobs of the 1870s did never make it into the U.S. Capitol, uh, but certainly they they tried at the local and state level. There's so much in there that's interesting to kind of tease apart. I think the the Wallace parallel is a really strong one. I, I, like you, I have felt, I went back and actually taught a course on election, on the election last mm. fall and uh, went back and watched Wallace speeches. And you're right, the intonation, um, joke mixed with threat, yeah. um, college professors, lawyers, media as enemy. And of course, that's rhetoric that you might hear from a lot of standard issue Republicans, um, even some liberals under some circumstances. But the way it's delivered, the theatricality yeah. of it is really intense. I wanted to go back one thing you said about the commission because, um, you know, we have seen these before. I'm thinking of the Kerner Commission, mm -hmm. for example, as an attempt to kind of take the really sort of devastating series of events and package them together and say, okay, we're going to take a real study of this in Congress and there'll be real remedies. You looking you expecting something like that? Or once again, was the context of that time, 67, 68, um, special? And maybe there was more consensus in Congress that one had to act than we have now. I'm sort of curious yeah. how you put that commission process in a broader trajectory of American history. Well, you know, these commissions yield all kinds of results, right? And, and, and some very famous shifts that we've had in American society and American policy with the results. So the, the Marshall Plan, right? Or uh, the shift to an all-volunteer army. Uh, these are ones that had meaningful results. Truman Civil Rights uh, uh, Commission in 47, 48. Didn't get things right away, but set some stuff uh, on the civil rights agenda that were then uh, done down the line. Uh, I do think we'll have uh, something here akin to the, the Kerner Commission as a good analog. Yeah, but the Kerner Commission was a little different in that it really sought to address a wide array of uh, legitimate grievances in the African-American community that they felt had contributed to the, the conditions that led to these now annual urban riots in the summer, right? And so identifying uh, the role of, uh, really for the first time in, in a really um, articulate way, uh, the deep roots of systemic racism, of institutionalized discrimination, and what that meant for African-Americans and why they had frustrations. An attempt to communicate those ideas to the white community, right? Um, now, as good as the Kerner report was, we have to remember its its recommendations were never implemented, right? Uh, and largely because of the timing. The Kerner report came out in the summer of 68, uh, as Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society were on the way out, and Richard Nixon and the silent majority were on the way in. And they saw urban problems in very different ways. Johnson had always said, we need to basically treat the causes of this uh, and uh, and whereas uh, Nixon's uh, approach was, we just need tougher law and order, right? So don't don't try to explain this. Just crack down on the criminality, and that'll end it, right? You know, a kind of a get tough approach. 
And so here it's a little different because the timing is going to be different. We're not going to have a change in presidential administration uh, from one party to the next to the next four years. Right. So we're kind of locked in at that level. Congress is in uh, a Democratic hands at least for the next two years, barring some, you know, insane Jim Jeffords like switch, which will uh, 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 throw control of a chamber. I don't see that coming. Mm -hmm. So that means that the political status quo will be there, presumably, if the commission does its work in a semi-timely fashion, gets a report out, say, late 2021, 2022. They could actually be some recommendations. But what they would do would be, I think, a little bit more um, scaled down than the Kerner Commission. Mm -hmm. The Kerner Commission, again, you know, looked broad across uh, the broad swath of American society to try to identify what had gone wrong in a variety of cities over the years. This would really be an effort to trace what happened in this one riot, right? Mm -hmm. To really track, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, who had motivated it. Uh, how they'd motivated it, what kind of coordination there was, where the failures were in security, and what lessons could be learned mm -hmm. from that. So it's much more of a kind of forensic style presidential commission. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe the analog of the 60s is the Warren Commission looking into the JFK assassination, right? right? Um, which and I don't want to go to kind of Oliver Stone conspiracy theories uh, here about that, but that had much more of a, of a focused mandate uh, and, and I think was able to... Um, for better or worse, generate a little bit more attention and traction uh, than the than the Kerner Commission ultimately did. So I think we could see something like that. And I do think it's meaningful. I think it's necessary. I think they've got to uh, take a look mm -hmm. at this and not simply sweep it under the rug. And this is something I'll, I keep talking. This is something that I think we've got to really look at across the government this, this period. There's a real instinct on the part of politicians, and I've ranted about this endlessly, but there's an instinct on the part of politicians to turn the page. Sure. We're not going to look back. We're going to look forward. We're going to turn the page. We're not going to dwell on the past. If you don't do that, if there's no accountability, then the same mistakes happen again, often by the same actors, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no, if no one's been penalized for their role in fostering an insurrection, you can bet they'll do it again. So there's got to be a real reckoning with this. And, and law enforcement is going to do their things. But Congress has a role here in terms of educating the public. Uh, and making uh, some political changes, uh, which which are outside the reach of, of law enforcement. And all that absolutely needs to happen, I think. You know, in what you were just talking about there and the analog to the Kerner Commission looking at sort of the roots of structural racism, one does wonder what kind of structures one would look for in a future January 6th commission. And I know, uh, like you, I don't want to go too far uh, with conspiracy theory on like the Warren Commission. At the same time, I can't help but wonder if, if that isn't the area where a commission like that is, is going to have to look. I mean, QAnon, disinformation, central yeah. features, uh, maybe not always central features in American politics, sometimes very peripheral, but have moved one yeah. or two uh, quanta closer to the nucleus here. I guess I want to get your sense of that too, how you've seen disinformation and conspiracy moving through not just January 6th, but this sort of pandemic era as well. Yeah, I think this is an understudied aspect. We, we think of these as, as discrete issues, but, but I really do uh, think that there's something to the idea that we've seen an uptick in the conspiracy theories uh, that really fueled that insurrection um, because of the pandemic. Uh, it's part, definitely, the Trump administration, the Trump era has legitimized these voices and mainstreamed them. Um, uh, it's a little exaggerated, but again, I keep going back to the 60s, it's a little exaggerated. There was a famous moment in the 60s where William F. Buckley basically told the John Birch Society uh, that you can't be part of respectable conservatism. And, and that was a little exaggerated, but Buckley knew it was in their interest to draw a bright line. Well, the opposite's happening now. And, and the president encouraged those on the fringe to be welcomed in. And now the party is... Increasingly being, uh, it's not led by uh, QAnon people, but it's led by people who are giving uh, free reign to that. And we started to see QAnon uh, Congress people, certainly, and they are uh, really, it seems, the wave of the, of the future. I'd be stunned if in 2022 we don't see dozens of people like um, uh, like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert uh, running for uh, Congress uh, and, and doing well in the Republican primaries. And because of uh, uh, gerrymandering and, and, and polarization winning, right? So so this is a serious issue. But I, I think that that there, the QAnon conspiracies and the others have really flourished over the last year, again, not just because of Trump's encouragement, but because of the pandemic. Because what it meant was everyone was isolated. 
everyone was dropped off in their own little home, their own space, cut off from whatever uh, real life social communities they might have had, and instead interacted with the world uh, through these laptops, through these cameras. And that kind of isolation both gave people more time to spend on the internet. Uh, I think we've, we've certainly all felt that because that was our one way to connect with people, but also then led them further and further into these kind of social media traps where you have these rabbit holes that can suck people in on, on YouTube, on, on Twitter, on, on Reddit, wherever, uh, that increasingly drive you down uh, into one of these conspiracy theories. And so I think that has really, uh, that certainly helped fuel uh, the rise of these, uh, of these conspiracy groups. I'm glad you made that connection to the pandemic because I wanted to, to sort of bring that in now as a, as a layer to explore with you. And, and just to stay with what you said for a minute, um, I think it's really interesting that a time in isolation, which has become a signal feature of pushback against public health measures throughout the pandemic, has also fostered a, a kind of a malevolence or a virus of its own, if you will. Um, but at the same time, when I look back at that crowd on January 6th, it's not just, well, I don't know who was in the crowd, but it's not just QAnon. I mean, even just looking at the work that the Times and the Post and others have done to sort of identify crowd shots. Yeah. Um, which is a kind of creepy kind of journalism, I have to say. I mean, it's an interesting, it's a fascinating journalism, mm -hmm. but it looks like old FBI stuff from the 60s and 70s. But um, there's white nationalists there. Yep. Uh, there's a real mixed bag. Do you think this sort of pandemic heightened anger applies to them as well? Or do we just look into the crowd and the crowd is the, is the mob made up of whoever has a grievance that day? I've been trying to figure out just this question that you posed, how the pandemic is opera operationalizing certain people, but others might have been there anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think others would have been there anyway. Um, uh, but, but I do think the pandemic and more importantly, the response to it, um, really, um, uh, set off, uh, a certain set of, um, uh, triggers for, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, with a, with a subset on the American right that really has resented and resisted, um, uh, any kind of government regulation, um, and, and any sense of the public good, uh, uh and, and has a, a kind of a sense that anything that's meant to limit them, um, must be, um, antithetical to their freedom and must be resisted at all cost, uh, And just no sense of, of wanting to go along with, uh, you know, quarantine recommendations or, or, or mask recommendations or anything like that. Again, the president's, uh, the former president's lack of leadership on these issues not wanting to be seen wearing a mask. Uh, he got vaccinated in January and kept it secret, uh, apparently, um, yeah. uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, have, have only fueled the ideas that this isn't that serious and that actually the efforts to contain and control it are the real threat to, uh, to America. And therefore, again, you need to resist. It's this constant feedback that uh, the base is the victim. Uh, mm. and therefore needs to lash out and act out in order to push back against the real bullies out there. The, the idea that Dr. Fauci is some kind of power mad mastermind who's yeah. intent on controlling people's lives uh, is a little ludicrous, but when you're in search of a villain, um, I guess you can find anybody. Uh, the, when you mention Fauci and, and the idea that the mask is somehow the yoke of oppression and social distancing is somehow a form of of um well you know they it's described in many different ways but you know taking away one's rights in a profound way um I, not a lot of things surprise me about american politics anymore i guess i have to admit i mean i should have seen that kind of thing coming i guess but I, i'd like to gauge your level of surprise interest how you started to process particularly as we moved into the late spring and the summer of last year when it became more and more clear that pushing back against science and public health measures was actually going to be not just a virtue signal, but an electoral strategy. Yeah. I was, I was blown away by that. Yeah. Um, yeah, th that was really surprising to me because when it, when it happened, when it became clear, but how serious it was going to be, I actually thought, okay, well, this is, this is a gift to Donald Trump and the Republican party. This is an absolute gift. If there's a national crisis, there's a rally around the flag effect and had the roles been reversed, had it been President Hillary Clinton, it would have been a disaster. But with a Republican in office, you know folks on the left are going to 
do whatever they can to try to mitigate this, if only for their own survival, and will happily go along with 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 government orders to quarantine and mask and do all the rest. Uh, and the rest of the country will come around because they're going to back their guy, right? He would have seen a huge surge in popularity uh, that would have, I think, lifted uh, many more Republicans uh, into office had they done the same. And we saw this all across the globe. You know, world leaders, with the exception of Donald Trump, saw their popularity uh, tick up. No matter how well they actually handled it, the fact right. that they were seen as taking charge of it uh, was enough to kind of rally people around them. And Trump clearly could have done that. Instead, he leaned into uh, this kind of you're not the boss of me uh, approach, which then le- encouraged others at the uh, at the state and local level to, to do the same thing. Um, uh, and again, it's it's remarkable uh, the way in which they they framed it that way. Again, you would you would think trying to keep your constituents from dying would be a pretty big priority for politicians, but instead they framed it as uh, our li- liberties are dying and our economy is dying. Uh, and that was uh, more than enough for the people who who took their cues from them. I think we underestimate how much, at least in the kind of a knee-jerk partisan world we live in today, that, that ordinary voters on both sides of the aisle mm-hmm. really take their cues about what is right and what is wrong from what does my team say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they follow that to the end, right? So what you're describing then indicates that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but your working theory here is that if Trump had adopted he could have even sort of said, I don't like it, but this is what we have to do to, yeah. to save lives and gone along with uh, masks and uh, rejected hydroxy and the various other uh, acts in that play. Um, you think that, um, bringing it back to what we were talking about before, do you think January 6th would have would have happened or that's a little bit of a what if, but but do you think the the momentum of that kind of a drive and that anger, you think he could have he could have slowed that momentum, he could have put that out? Well, I think, you know, honestly, had he really leaned into it, he could, there's, a, you could argue he wins the election. You don't even know, right. So January 6th is the celebration of a tr- second Trump term. There's definitely no right, so there's no right then. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but had he taken a more responsible view early on, um, I do think you would have seen uh, slightly less of a widespread uh, a pushback against all forms of authority other than Trump. Uh, and and you would have seen uh, a little more restraint uh, on the part of his fans. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID Calls, and I'm talking today with historian Kevin M. Cruz about the pandemic and politics and history. You can get your questions into YouTube Live in the chat there, or you can put questions up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag me at US of Disaster, and we'll get to those. I want to just sort of bring it out one level. One of the things that's great about talking to you and following your work is you're so so comfortable and good at sort of talking about the moment and then bringing it out a couple of layers to talk about the 19th century and the earlier 20th century, which is the kind of thinking, of course, all historians as teachers and writers really hope to bring into the uh, into broader discussion. So with that in mind, I mean, some of the themes you are really expert in, um, like segregation, for example, post-war uh, segregation, those broader themes have been on my mind a lot and and others. And I wonder how you have revisited those themes in your previous work in light of the pandemic. And let's just start with that one. Yeah. Post-war segregation, white flight, the process of resegregation that we've seen either even in suburban and broader mm-hmm. metropolitan regions. How do you attach that analysis to what we saw last year in the pandemic, and then maybe also with the deaths of Breonna Taylor and and George Floyd. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, And it's remarkable. You know, I've, um, I've talked more about that book, White Flight in the last four years than I did in the previous, you know, decade. Um, uh, And happy to talk about my work. um, But as somebody who works on white supremacy, I would love to be a little less, you know, um, um, necessary uh, at a moment like this. I'm sure other people who work in the field would, would agree. Uh, I have been forced to revisit it because uh, White Flight is a book that I, I structured in a couple of ways. One was I moved through the chronology and the various issues in which segregation unfolds. But, but it kind of loosely we begin, and I follow the pattern of desegregation in Atlanta, Loosely begin with residential neighborhoods, which are the first uh, to shift hands, public spaces, uh, the golf courses, the parks, the pools, things like that. 
then the public schools, and then finally it comes to private businesses at the end. Uh, and so I move through uh, in that in that way. But the real story isn't just simply moving through space and moving through these issues. Uh, but the real story I told was one in which I argued that over time, white supremacy um, uh, takes on less obviously racial and racist tones and becomes much subtler and much stronger as a result. So the book starts with um, this, well, there's an opening chapter on, on, on how Atlanta comes to be and, and, and the politics there. But the real main meat of the book starts with a story about the first neo-Nazi group in America, this group called the Colombians, which forms in Atlanta. And then I move into the Klan. And then I move into a homeowners group. And as I go through these groups, I show how they become less and less overtly um, starkly white supremacists. Again, a neo-Nazi organization, the Klan slightly, but only a little bit better. And then this organization of homeowners who presents themselves not as white supremacists, but simply as concerned taxpayers, interested in property values, um, worried about community stability, on and on. As I showed, it's some of the same people who are in the neo-Nazi group, the Klan, and the homeowners organization, but they learn over time to make their arguments a little more subtle, and they become much more effective. They become much more part of respectable conversation. So the story I told in White Flight is one of segregationists and white supremacists becoming um, uh, much, again, much subtler, much stronger in their, in their messaging. The idea that neo-Nazis would be on the march in Charlottesville in 2017, that the, we would have a resurgence of, of white supremacist groups uh, akin to the Klan in this era, and they would be talking about these things openly and publicly, really shatters a lot of that kind of narrative arc I had in the book. Again, I wrote that in uh, there's a dissertation in the late 90s. The book came out in 2005 during the Bush years, where it seemed like conservatism had finally learned, uh, or the elements of conservatism that had engaged in that kind of racism, had learned to tone it down, right? And, and, and indeed had moved past it. This was the era in which uh, the head of the RNC is apologizing for the Southern strategy, right? right? You know, we even used code words in the past. We shouldn't do that. And now we come to the point where the president is not using code words, but using a bullhorn uh, uh, to, to, to speak uh, this kind of white supremacist language and white supremacists are out in the open. So it really has forced me to rethink um, uh, some of the almost teleological assumptions I had about uh, how things were getting better. These almost Whiggish pro uh, progress of, 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 of racism is being stomped out. No, it's alive and well. So uh, were I to um, uh, revisit that book then now, uh, I would have to uh, uh, write a, a, I think, a considerably a different foreword for it. I actually, I hope you'll do that. And and um, I press hope so too. I got to find the time. <laughs> add, add that to your to your list of projects. But just to stay with that for a second, because it taps back to the, what we were talking about with Trump and a kind of a cult of personality. And maybe this is a tension never to be resolved, but it's just a feature of American democracy. But one does wonder if the structures of segregation had been more thoroughly dismantled, particularly, it, we were talking about the Kerner Commission before, as we get from the 60s and into yeah. the 70s and even into the 1980s, um, then there isn't enough oxygen for those louder voices, those neo-Nazi voices, those Donald Trump voices, they could be barking on the side, but the sort of deeper structure, which I th think most people would agree is really the root of the problem. Americans of different races still in many ways live different lives in terms of how they work, where they worship, how they're compensated, how their healthcare is delivered and, and so on. I, I wonder how you would approach that. Those, those deeper structures had been more thoroughly dismantled, would we have had this kind of an effect in the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's it does speak to the way in which Americans have told themselves that racial discrimination was thoroughly kind of stamped out in the 60s. Uh, and and there, there's there's nothing more needed to do. In fact, if you if you address anything, you are engaged in reverse racism uh, this this kind of trope of colorblind conservatism uh, that takes hold on the right uh, and takes hold specifically as a way to blunt the civil rights agenda. Uh, Pat Buchanan and others are talking about this behind the scenes in the 70s uh, in very clear terms, I think. Um, but because uh, Americans have come to believe that, again, 
everything was was solved with Martin Luther King. The story of Martin Luther King Day we have every year. Um, everyone seems to know one line from the I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. And the familiar narrative is that uh, Martin Luther King um, uh, sacrificed himself, died on the cross for our sins, uh, and our sins have been washed away. Uh, and that's simply not true. It wasn't true then. It wasn't true with Reconstruction before, another uh, opp missed opportunity where we swept a lot of bad stuff under the rug. Uh, only to resent it later. Had we gone fully in on really thinking about, again, as the Kerner Commission urged us to do, to think about the the deep levels of systemic racism, uh, I think we would have avoided a lot of uh, a lot of things that that got us here. Um, what's different today, though, uh, is that um, there's at least even without that kind of um, introspection on the part of government. Um, this is the one positive of uh, our current era of social media and technology is that these things that have always been a problem are suddenly been thrown in everyone's faces or at least on their laptops and, and cell phones. Uh, it's not that police brutality is a new issue. Um, as, again, as we know from the Kerner Commission and, and things before, it's been a perennial complaint uh, on the part of African-Americans. Even in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, there are lines about police brutality. Uh, I wish people would start quoting those too to realize that this is an issue that's uh, that's still gone on. But today... Those same stories that have been routine in the black community are on everyone's cell phones. Everyone's carrying around a news studio in their pocket and broadcasting these things. And that's forced people uh, to, to, to reckon with them. And I think that's what our, a lot of the resentment on the right comes from, is mm -hmm. that it's no longer plausible deniability. You can't simply pretend this didn't happen or, or blame it on a criminal element or outside out agitators or, or oh, those, those people had it coming. The video's out there. And people are forced to judge with their own eyes. And that is, I think, too uncomfortable a truth uh, for some people here. And, th and that's what they're pushing back against. I want to bring up another uh, layer of this. I've been um, walking around listening to the audio book of your tremendous co-authored book, Fault Lines, mm -hmm. uh, with Julian Zelliser. And um, number one, I want everybody to know it's it's okay to listen to audio books. It's Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And number two, it probably won't surprise people that I walk around listening to audiobooks about the dissolution of American uh, <laughs> life and politics um, as a disaster researcher. But I think there's a lot in that book which actually helps us understand American disaster response as well. And one of those things has to do with um, party polarization, mm -hmm. um, which at various times in American life is celebrated as a great you know, strength in our, in our polity. And at this time, I think we see as something which has moved into a destructive phase. So I wanted to ask you about that too, and how you see party polarization. We were touching on it a little bit before with the Southern strategy, but um, I mean, the fact again, that one party seems to take up the idea that wearing a mask is a great public health measure and will save your life. And the other says, if you wear a mask, you're a, you're a traitor to the mm -hmm. founding of the, of the country. That's a kind of polarization we don't see too frequently in American history, or right. correct me if I'm wrong and, and, and tell us where we see it. But I'm curious about where you, again, see the pandemic in the light of, that, of those fault lines and that fracturing that's taking yeah, place. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we, we certainly, we've entered an era in which the, the kind of the partisan sorting that's been underway really in earnest for the last 50 years or so uh, has, has reached a, a kind of a, a critical point. Um, actually, we passed it probably a, a decade ago. You know, it used to be, for those who don't follow this stuff closely, it used to be the two parties were both ideologically diverse. For much of the 20th century, you had conservatives in the Republican Party and liberals in the Republican Party. You had conservatives in the Democratic Party and liberals in the Democratic Party. Uh, and, and this is why they were, we talk about this golden age of bipartisanship. That was simply because no matter where you stood on the ideological spectrum, no matter what you wanted to get done, the people like you were in your party and the other parties. You had to reach across the aisle, right? Uh, and that basic fact led to a lot more cooperation. It also led to the party leadership not kind of uh, having a, a tight control over their caucuses, which was actually good. There was a little more independence from committee chairs who had more power. Again, good and bad end, ends there. But it was all over the place, right? And instead, what we've had since really the uh, uh, the 90s that's really taken off with, with full speed is the parties have moved further and further to the corners. I'd argue the Republicans have moved further to the, and faster to the right than Democrats have to the left. But there's a great deal of sorting, right? That level of overlap we used to see between the two parties is gone, right? And they're out there. And in fact, the biggest threat 
to most incumbents uh, is that they work across the aisle on something, God forbid, and then they get singled out as being traitors to the cause, right? We saw this with the, the three Republican senators who voted for the Stimulus Act uh, after the, uh, the 2008 uh, Wall Street meltdown, were singled out as rhinos, right? And Olympia Snow gave up on politics. Arlen Specter switched to the Democrats to try to save his skin and failed. Susan Collins muddled on. I think Susan Collins, um, she's like a, 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 a politically, she's like a cockroach and that she'll outlive us all. You know, nuclear war could happen and Susan Collins would still be there in Maine, apparently. <laughs> Uh, but for most people, it's dangerous, right? And we saw this during uh, the rest of the Obama years, where the lessons that the Republicans took was, um, we can get success by denying any bipartisanship. Obama had come in kind of naively promising to be a post-partisan president. He tried to do all these things to reach across the aisle to Republicans. Uh, almost had three Republicans in his cabinet, the stimulus plan, uh, health care, all modeled on a lot of Republican ideas and found them standing in lockstep in opposition because they realized he promised bipartisanship, we can make him a liar by simply re refusing to go along, right? And, and these marching orders were given, we know this through Mitch McConnell and Eric Cantor. But what turned out is even that strategy of denying him all, all the votes, of, of refusing to go along, wasn't an ironclad one to protect their hides, and Eric Cantor learned this himself. He strayed from the Republican orthodoxy on one issue, immigration, and he got one of the most powerful members of Congress. He got primaried from the right and he lost. He lost oh. to an economics professor, right? Who had, I think, no political experience before and a kind of stunning defeat. So that's what happens now. All the Republicans are looking over their shoulder to the right. Democrats, I think, are increasingly learning to look over their left. They're all worried they're going to get primaried by an AOC type or something like that. And that's the real alarm. Uh, and that's meant that they move further and further apart. They're constantly looking to the corners and everything reinforces this. Social media has sliced and diced the electorate and uh, and you can be in an echo chamber if you want. The media has been sliced and diced as well. You can find a cable news channel that meets your exact brand of politics. You can find a radio station or blogs that meet your exact brand of politics uh, and become an echo chamber, right? Uh, gerrymandering and, and has gotten worse and worse. Campaign finance has gotten worse and worse. So we've seen this push out to the end. And so that's really what has been remarkable in this moment is that push to the corners. And again, this last year, the pandemic has only deepened that, right? Because all the things that we might, that might jumble up our, our those partisan worldviews in our own particular locations of meeting kids at a, other families at a soccer game or uh, a, a PTA uh, a thing or, or going into your office and, and talking to someone there. All those things have been really isolated. And instead, we just get this one-on-one -on -one relationship with the internet, which then for most of us means we go back to our priors and find them reconfirmed over and over and over again. So it just, I think, has led to even more uh, partisanship and polarization. Let me bring this back to the to the pandemic a little bit. And, you know, if you go back and look at the uh, roll call vote of relief after the relief bill after Hurricane Katrina. And there were a few voices on the right who said, uh, unfortunately, the House Speaker, but there were a few voices who said, you know, forget New Orleans, this New Orleans is a cesspool and, and that's right. that. But in the main, Republicans got on board with that relief bill. And then if you go and look at the Hurricane Sandy relief bill, not many years after that, it's already breaking along yeah. party lines. And now it's pretty well expected that disaster relief bills and even funding of FEMA or even acknowledging that, coming back to our conspiracy talk, that FEMA is not uh, have a fleet of black helicopters right. that's going to put people in, um, you know, Walmarts that are converted into holding pens. I mean, it's kind of really insane stuff. Um, that seems to be where we are now. So disaster, rather than providing a ground, which it often has in American history, an easy ground. Yeah. Um, for politicians to reach across and score political points with their more moderate um, supporters, it hasn't. So it bears out exactly the theory that you're putting forward, the description that you're putting yeah. forward. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. But then I guess also the question everybody's thinking of is what can we pull from history to show how Americans have pulled back from that ledge? Because that's really a death spiral, it seems to me, in terms of functioning governance, what you've described. It, it totally is. Uh, first of all, the, the shift you note is, is absolutely true. And I would say that, um, you know, I think we might have seen the fall off in Republican support for disaster relief earlier 
had Katrina not also ravaged Mississippi and Texas too, you know, it, so it wasn't just New Orleans was certainly the, uh, the worst hit, but th there were lots of other red state areas uh, that were obliterated by that. Whereas um, with, with Sandy, it was the Northeast corridor. Um, and, 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 you know, I can't hear New Jersey, uh, Chris Car Christie's response on that was as it should have been. He didn't, wasn't looking for partisan responses, but he got crucified for, walking on the beach with the president of the United States who'd come to make sure that New Jersey, his constituents had what they needed in a major natural disaster, right? Insane that that would be held against him. Um, so, uh, but that's just, uh, I think a show of, of how far we've gone, but yeah, it really is. Um, it really is a remarkable shift. These natural disasters used to be the thing on which everyone would get along. There weren't, you know, um, there might have been 9-11. I don't remember a whole lot of people grumbling about, you know, uh, that was the, the one moment where everybody suddenly seemed to care about New York uh, and, and D.C. Uh, but we've come a, a long way from that now. Uh, and it really is remarkable. And I think what I find odd is that uh, and you've seen this pitched lately as blue state bailouts um, uh, for COVID. Um, but if you look at who's putting money into the federal coffers, it's largely blue states. Uh, I'm not sure this is a game that uh, Republican politicians really want to push out because uh, a lot of these red states are the ones that give less in federal taxation than they get back on federal services. If they want to make this uh, a condition of, of uh, or based on partisan uh, uh, identity, I think that's a losing proposition for them, right? You know, if California doesn't send its money into FEMA anymore. You can't slice and dice it like that, but just hypothetically. But saves it for itself, for its own wildfires, you know, uh, uh, and the northern, northeast states do the same thing. The next time Texas gets hammered, it's going to be on its own, you know, and until it gets a, a Democratic governor, I guess, according to this theory. It just seems wholly wrong on multiple levels and just needlessly cruel. Um, uh, it really shows the way in which people have stopped understanding the government as an extension of ourselves, uh, mm. someone that is there to meet our needs, uh, and rather as this foreign entity that must be crushed. And that's just a dangerous, uh, it's a dangerous attitude for, I think, any American to hold, uh, but particularly for elected representatives who go into government and then kind of actively work to undermine it. Um, it just, it just seems perverse. You think it's somehow possible as we move into 2021, which will be a year of I, I think the pandemic will continue a lot longer than that and for many people for a long time but vaccination is increasing as you pointed out children will be going back to school the economy is is likely to rebound that that could become the ground um for some reconciliation across party lines or you think now this is just a new structure that's in place and it's gonna have to be broken and with other means campaign finance reform or or some new uh, innovation I think, in media or, broken. I think, I think yeah. because uh, at this level, there's, there's nothing. And I, I do agree. I think those things are likely, I think we're going to see um, it's not going to be immediate, but we're going to see some greater control of COVID through the vaccination. We're going to see as a result of that, uh, a bounce back in the economy. Uh, I think um, the most indicators will be looking good uh, by 2022, but uh, there's going to be no incentive, in fact, the exact opposite, for any Republicans to say, you know, Joe Biden did a great job. Democrats right. did a great job on this. Uh, I apologize and I'm for them. That's not of their own electoral interest. Um, they'll be either finding fault with a re response uh, and or finding new things to complain about. We've already seen this. Um, the first, uh, the Biden administration is, is about a month old, a little more than that. Yeah. And, and several um, conservative outlets have already proclaimed it a failure. It's the worst thing ever. It's and so Ted Cruz said that you know it's uh, I can't vote to put some of these cabinet secretaries in, and these policies which haven't been enacted have already ruined the country. I mean it's it's just right. right. And so the script's already been written there. So no matter what actually happens, I think you're going to see that pushback. The key comes with voters, right? At a certain level, do voters look at what's going on in their lives? Again, COVID's been solved. The economy's back. My kids are back at school. I'm back in the office. Everything's back to normal. The Democrats had a hand in that. Thank you. If that's the response, then they might finally kick Republicans away. Um, but until that reckoning comes, uh, I don't think you're going to see uh, much of a change. 
talking to Kevin Cruz today on COVID calls, and we're almost up on time, but um, Kevin, just have a couple of minutes left. And since you mentioned Ted Cruz, I thought it'd be good to close out with a bit of a discussion here about your um, your activity on on Twitter and social media. You also write a column, as you mentioned. Um, you're in news media frequently. Uh, you don't get an hour, I think, usually, if ever, to go into the kind of detail we've had a chance to talk about today. That's part of the discipline of doing that work is fitting mm -hmm. it into a few characters or 30 right. seconds. And I know that's hard and you're excellent at it. And, and I, I want to and I want to just sort of thank you for that, because I think for many historians over the last few years, seeing the way, particularly on Twitter, that you bring evidence based but um, tough um, discussion into that space. And you're not uh, shying away from talking back to Ted Cruz, for example, or others mm -hmm. who might yeah. try to um, create their own alternative history right. to serve their electoral or their profit motive needs or whatever it may be. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. And even if you might be willing to share with us a little bit your strategy of that, why yeah. you think it's worth your time um, to enter the public square in that way. Yeah. Uh, I should say, first of all, um, the reason I speak back to people like that is I don't have an excuse. I don't have an excuse not to. Um, uh, and I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a full professor at Princeton university. I have tenure. I have every, you know, comfort in the world. I am a cis hat, white, straight male Christian. I check every kind of box of, 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 of privilege there. Uh, and, and I know I catch 1% of the flack that colleagues who don't check all those boxes receive. I am well aware of that. And that only makes me realize I have no excuse not to, not to use this, uh, this platform to push back. I used to just yell at the TV, right? Uh, basic books, uh, with one nation under God forced me to get on social media. And I was never on Facebook. I didn't have a cell phone until 2002. I mean, and I'm not a Luddite. I just, I didn't see the use of it. Right. Um, and my first year on Twitter was kind of a, this day in history, this happened. All right, fine. You know, but who cares about that? It was only when I found my voice and, and the things I would yell at the TV, but you can yell on Twitter and I can get Joe Scarborough to change the story. Hey, that's cool. Or, or I can, you know, maybe again, I got Ted Cruz's attention. Okay, great. Um, and that kind of pushback, uh, I think, uh, I always joke when people say, thank you for, for Twitter. I'm doing this for myself. It keeps me relatively sane. Again, I'm not yelling as much on the couch. My wife, I'm yelling into the computer. My wife can't hear me, doesn't have to put up with that. Um, so that's why I do it. But that approach, I think, is, is one that, that, again, historians uh, and te all teachers uh, kind of instinctively know. Uh, and I use what I, how I work in the classroom. Uh, I use it uh, on Twitter. Uh, and it was a realization that um, Twitter let me do the same kind of things I would do in an op-ed of presenting an argument and trying to boil down these complex things into um, ways that might reach a you know the general educated public. That phrase all editors give you when you write an op-ed. Op an op Imagine a general, uh, a generally educated public. Um, but the same way I, I do with my my teaching, right? I'm trying to communicate these complex ideas in ways that you might get. And I've done op-eds for a while, but what Twitter lets you do is provide the evidence. And as someone, as an historian who's an archive rat, who lives with the primary sources as much as possible, I love that. I love that I get to, you know, I may be able to put a hyperlink to an article in something that appears on MSNBC Daily um, or, or, or somewhere else I write, but I can't just show you the stuff, right? Uh, and on Twitter, I get four images a tweet. And I can show you the, the the pictures of these things if need be. I can give screenshots of a book or an article. I can provide a photo. I can give a link to uh, a, an audio clip or a video of a speech. I can uh, give a hyperlink to the Republican, you know, a platform of 1964. Mm -hmm. And the why that's so useful is so much of Twitter becomes this back and forth of he said, she said, who knows that what we can do with this evidence is to say, don't listen to me. I never, I don't wade into these things. Sometimes I'll introduce it as, as an historian. Let me tell you about this, just to let people know I'm not just a rando, but that's not the end of my approach. I'm not simply invoking that authority and saying, this is true because I'm an historian end game, right? Instead, I say, this is how this actually works. And let me show you the evidence. Put this in your hands. You read this. 
You read this speech. You compare these two things. You look at this poll. You reckon with these primary sources, these newspaper articles, these magazine things, these cartoons. I've got uh, read some Dr. Seuss cartoons today uh, from mm -hmm. about the whole discussion about Dr. Seuss that was going on. Um, and that evidence works the same way it does in the classroom, where I don't try to persuade students, right. I'm the historian, you must listen to me. Instead, I give them the primary evidence and say, let's sort through this together. Let's try to make sense of this together. Uh, and that's much more useful uh, than simply kind of yelling another voice from on high and it just becomes like a cacophony of people screaming and said let's read a little bit right and that's what twitter lets you do just want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls and you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m eastern time and you can catch it anytime you want to on podcasts and uh, any podcast service that you use and i want to thank kevin cruz for your time today and particularly at the end there i'm glad you know i don't want to keep you from yelling at the tv that's fine but um, <laughs> i'm glad you've channeled it into this um other mode of pedagogy really um and if what it takes is to bring the crack crackle of a little bit of um anger to that pedagogy in this social media space so be it history mm -hmm. can we can stand that and exactly i appreciate right, you yeah. checking your privilege your privilege there as a person who can march into that. So Kevin, um, uh, just a really great hour. Thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, really enjoyed it, real pleasure. Stay healthy everybody, we'll see you tomorrow, five o'clock.